All right, welcome everyone who's joining. We're gonna start right on time here. So uh, hold tight for another minute or so while we populate the room. It's pretty interesting, all these different shots of different parts of Beckman. It's like a, it'd be an interesting game to try to guess where, where everybody is, what floor conference room, et cetera. Have you seen GeoGuessr? Have you watched like these GeoGuessr videos? No. So you can play this game called GeoGuessr and they'll like drop you in a Google Maps place somewhere random and you have to guess on a map where you are. And the closer you are, you get like higher points. Mm, that's pretty interesting. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started here as people are trickling in. We're gonna start by going through some administrative um, business. So if you miss, if, if uh, someone misses the first 30 seconds or so, it shouldn't be a big deal. Welcome everybody. It's a great pleasure to kick off um, a, new, a new term and to be back uh, teaching organometallics for the first time since 2019. It's always a um, special, Thrill. It's fun for me to be able to uh, um, dig back through my notes and, and think deeply about things I don't think deeply about every every day, and to interact with um, with uh, with you all, some of whom I, I already know well, others of whom hopefully I get to know well through the course of this class. This will be a very um, um, interactive class, so um, it you know the success of the class will hinge on everybody's active. Um, and, and enthusiastic participation. I think one of the um, themes I've heard after attending a lot of discussions about how to um, run online classes su successfully is that um, in general, it's harder to, to have an interactive classroom when everyone's remote. So the more things you can do to foster interactivity, the, the better. So that's, we'll, we'll err on that side and, and hopefully um, have a, a really fun dynamic class. Uh, to, to help me, um, I ask that uh, to the extent possible, try to keep your camera on. That will help me to follow um, your reactions and to follow, um, you know, your head nods. And, and as I was saying before, some, some people joined to make sure my super funny jokes are uh, well received. And uh, uh, so, so try to do that. And we'll also have things like breakout rooms and. Uh, Thanks, Van, for the courtesy LOL emoji. Uh, we'll have things like breakout rooms where it will really be helpful if you are um, if you have your camera enabled. Now I understand, I mean, we've been doing work from home for a long time, so I understand that it's not always possible to have your camera enabled. That's fine, you know, I, 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 I respect that, but to the extent possible, try to keep it enabled so we can keep the class as interactive as possible. Um, let's start out going through, um, some logistics. So this class is, is everyone able to see the um, syllabus here and my the screen share? Okay. Um, so the class is um, being uh, recorded and will be uh, available both through the Scripps um, um, uh, site and also through uh, YouTube. But I do ask for anybody who is taking the class uh, for a grade or pass fail to attend uh, in in live time whenever you can and if you can't to let me or the TAs know that you won't be able to uh, make it of course I understand that things do come up uh, but again because the class is meant to be pretty interactive it's important that people are not participating in live time and there, there are things like I mean maybe you know like if you have a zoom recording it doesn't record breakout rooms um, for example so you, you miss out on that if you're not taking it um, live, live time so uh, running through the um, logistical aspects of the class. So your two TAs for this will be uh, Van and uh, Tanner, who you've uh, already heard from over email. Um, every, uh, for every class, there'll be um, um, a uh, worksheet that will look like um, this. This is today's. Hopefully you all receive that. Um, we'll try to send it out the night before or the morning. Oh, there's nothing you need to do with it other than just have it with you. I recommend if you have a printer um, to print it out and keep it by you so you can jot down notes. If you don't have access to a printer, um, you just have to deal with toggling between screens unless you have multiple monitors. 
Uh, and, and so the, um, th these uh, worksheets will be um, uh, sort of uh, uh, provide uh, problems of the day that we'll go through together during the course of the class. And then we'll have some fun context of, of highlighting uh, a young chemist of the day who's within the first 10 years of beginning their career. And we'll try to, uh, to highlight a diverse collection of chemists from uh, all over the world who represent different subfields of organometallic chemistry and um, who are doing exciting stuff. And the purpose of this, of course, is to, to highlight um, what's uh, going on that, that's exciting in the field um, and, and to give you exposure to chemists that you maybe haven't come across um, each each and every day, and then and then a fun quote to to just get you get you thinking. So back to the um, syllabus. Um, in terms of the overall structure of the course, I, I think of it as really two 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 halves. In the first half, we'll we'll take time to establish core concepts uh, about structure, about bonding, about reactivity, and then we'll study those core concepts um, in in the context of several important catalytic transformations, including cross-coupling, including whole metathesis, um, and, and, and um, in, including um, um, biocatalysis, for example. Um, and, and I think one of the cool things about organometallic chemistry is there are clear um, learning uh, exit outcomes, you know, that there are clear ideas that we want uh, everyone in the class to, to take away from, from the class about, about how to do electron counting, about how to be able to rationally think through what a catalytic cycle of a new reaction might be. Uh, but then there are endless applications that um, some of which, you know, are now well entrenched in the literature, some of which maybe you, you will go on to invent one day. And, and so by learning these sort of core modules, then you can combine the modules into different uh, catalytic reactions. And of course, that's a central engine for or um, invention in this in this field of study. Uh, we'll have a series of, of guest lectures. They're, they're, um, most of the guest lectures are in the second half of the class. Uh, and the guest lectures will represent both uh, academic scientists and industrial scientists. For those guest lecture days, um, there'll be about an hour of, of um, lecture and, and, and scientific discussion. And then uh, we'll have a 15 to 30 minute panel at the end uh, where we, we um, it's sort of an open Q&A about career development, about um, you know, how to pick your postdoc, if that's the route you're going, uh, really just open season for our guest lectures. Um, in terms of grading, you can see how the um, grading is uh, distributed. Um, participation is an important component. Uh, we'll gauge participation in several ways. I'll uh, cold call on people through this high tech system I have with everybody's name who is enrolled in the class printed out. Um, We'll, we'll have, as I said, breakout sessions, we'll have uh, uh, polls and we'll have um, um, what are called uh, like one, one minute essay assignments or maybe two minute essay assignments. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll pose a question, you'll compose an answer or um, you could take, you know, jot down handwritten notes and take a screenshot or jot something on ChemDraw, whatever your preferred method is and then email it to the TAs. This is a way for us to just sort of constantly gauge whether um, you know, you're following the material and the concepts are, 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 um, are, are resonating with you. Uh, there's a Wikipedia project. I won't say more about this today, just in the interest of, of time. The only thing I ask you to do is uh, between now and, and um, you know, two weeks from now, start to think about um, what topic you might like to um, write about. So the idea is to either uh, fill in a gap in, in, in the current Wikipedia ohm of, of, of uh, in a, a subject that doesn't exist, an article that doesn't exist that you think would be helpful, or to find one that does exist that just doesn't have the level of depth to be useful. So we've had some awesome um, um, uh, Wikipedia articles come from this class. So if you go online and you read um, Reductive Elimination, the Wikipedia article that was original, the original version of it was written by uh, John Gurak, a former graduate student of mine. If you go to uh, Ugi Zamin, that was written by David Peters. If you go to Mukiyama Hydration, that was written by, by Sophie Shevick and, and on and on. So, so I think we're really adding value to the community. The idea is to take a deep dive into a subject that you wanna learn more about. And then rather than just hand in a term paper that then goes into the bin ultimately to, to make it publicly accessible, which of course I'm deeply passionate about. Um, there are two course, uh, there are two textbooks, one of which is you know quote unquote required and one of which is, is optional. So uh, the, the curriculum will be, uh, in, uh, intimately tied to the, the Crabtree uh, textbook. So at the bottom left of each handout of the day, you'll see which chapters of the Hartwig textbook it corresponds to. 
Uh, and then the Crabtree textbook is available through the library, um, which I think in, for certain topics especially can provide a nice supplement and it has nice uh, discussion as well. Um, I think that is all I wanted to go over for the um, uh, syllabus. So the, oh, the other thing is, um, you know, I'll, I'll occasionally pose open-ended questions to the group, or if you want to, um, if you have a question, you can either ask that through the chat window, that's fine. I won't always have my eye on the chat window, so I'll just rely on the TAs to, to flag things as questions come up. Um, or you can unmute yourself and, 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 and jump right in. That's, that's great too. Um, so on that note, any, any questions um, before we uh, jump in? Okay, so we'll, we'll start today with a poll. So this is uh, not so much to test your comprehension, but to test our ability to execute a poll and to show you, show you how this is gonna, uh, gonna work. So here's the poll. Hopefully everybody can see this. Um, please let us know if you, for some reason, can't see this. And the question is, what is the first organometallic reaction that you ever ran during the course of your research? And I, I, sh I should say that um, you know the polls are set up so that we can record who is responding. So this is a, a sort of a cheap and easy way for us to take um, attendance or, or I said, you know, when it's a more technical question, of course, to track understanding. Uh, so if you are enrolled in the class and trying to get credit, then make sure you, you know, respond to the, the polls. Well, pretty good. How long is this one set to run for, Van, or do we kill it whenever it starts? I can end it whenever. Right now we're at 86 or 89 percent. So okay. Well, one or two people may be away from there. A few people. Yeah, it also might count yourself. like you and Tanner. <laughs> oh, I've got. It. Oh, that's right. I should fill this out too. But um. Yeah, I responded. You did. Okay. The first, how do I fill? <laughs> how do I fill it out? Maybe I can't fill it out if I'm a host. I, I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Okay, I'll just end it here. It's okay. already one thirty. Okay. Good. So, so these are the results. Okay, this is pretty similar to what I expected, and it's a good segue into our first topic of the class, which is uh, main group organometallic chemistry, uh, focusing on um, particularly Grignard reagents, organomagnesium reagents, uh, organolithium reagents, and organoaluminum reagents. Uh, cross coupling uh, has uh, that that is uh, uh, not not surprising, and and no one has run a, a Wow, not even, no one has run CH activation or, or Buckwald Hartwig as their first. first. So I'll, I'll tell Jen he's still got work to do. Uh, hydrogenation, oh, that's a good one. Okay, well, th thank you. So let's close that poll then. Okay, I think I press close. And then let me switch over to now I need to do a new share. So I'll be, um, th the format of this will be, you know, quasi, quasi chalk doc. So I'll be, um, oh, I have this, my, my chalkboard is uh, turned off. So I have my quasi chalkboard or whiteboard here. I'm using an app called uh, Notability. If you like, if you, maybe you have another app that you like, I'd recommend this one if you, if you, if you, uh, don't so this is just meant to basically mimic what I would present on the chalkboard, but hopefully with with better um, clarity. And you know, at the beginning of each class, I'll have some sections sort of filled out so that I can um, in, engage with you all uh, as I'm as I'm filling out the the rest of it. So you don't need to panic. I think you'll have enough time to um, jot jot these down. And, and also, if there's structures that I know that I'm going to have a hard time drawing in, in, in live time and I don't want to embarrass myself, then I'll, then I'll just go ahead and draw them uh, ahead of time. Um, okay, so uh, to, to kick off the class, I'll, I'll take uh, just five or 10 minutes to talk about a, 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 a philosophy of science subject that is near and dear to my heart um, and also near and dear, I think, to Ryan Chenby's heart, if you've heard him talk about this. And, and, and this is um, uh, 
called uh, strong inference. It's a form of inductive logic that is especially powerful. I would say in, 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 in scientific research in general, in chemistry in general, but particularly in, in thinking about mechanism, which is gonna come up again and again in, in this class. And so if you've attended the um, Organometallics Bootcamp, Ryan gives a great talk on strong inference. So some of this will be repetitive and that's why I'll go through it quickly. But I think this is one of these um, lessons that hopefully I can impart on you that will be relevant irrespective of what you go on to do in your career, whether it's a career in medicinal chemistry or process chemistry or in academia. Um, these, these lessons will ho hopefully continue to resonate. Um, and so the, the, the story here, I mean, it really dates all the way back to the beginning of, of, of scientific research as, a, as, an, as an enterprise. But, uh, we, you know, in general, people point back to, to, to this 1964 paper by Platt that appeared in Science and remarkably then got reprinted in Science uh, in, in, in one year later. So the, Platt gets two science papers for the price of one. I don't think you get that these, these days. But I think that just goes to show um, how much attention it attracted when it when it first hit the press, and back then they they literally had that had a press. So, um, okay, let me. I've got to figure out how I can keep an eye on uh, the gallery view and the screen at the same time, um, and and just to um, you know to to. To, to orient everybody to summarize very briefly in case you didn't have a chance to read it. If you, if you didn't, that's fine. Um, we just sent it out yesterday, but I would encourage you at some point to just take you know, 20 minutes and, and read through this. It's very short, it's a good read. Um, and and, and um, you know, Platt holds no, uh, this is sort of a no holds barred uh, 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 article. He starts out and, and, and immediately gets to, to the point. Um, scientists these days, tend to keep up the polite fiction that all science is equal. And, and of course, this is a, you know, a controversial statement. And what he's trying to draw attention to is the fact that at that time, especially, there were some fields of science like microbiology and astrophysics that were proceeding at a very rapid pace, whereas others were sort of languishing. And um, uh, Thinking carefully about what was what the difference is between these fields that were moving quickly and those that were moving slowly, he came to the realization that um, fields in, in, in that embrace this approach of multiple hypothesis generation and followed by systematic refuti refutation of hypotheses one by one tended to move very very rapidly, and those that believed in more, uh, you know, either one hypothesis at a time thinking or more sort of um, you know, anecdotal reasoning um, um, tended to t t tended to, to proceed at a at a at a slower pace, um, and this is something I think we can apply to our own research. Um, you know, how often, um, let's say, it, it, you're in the context of a, of a of a total synthesis campaign, you have four different ideas in mind, and and the best way to prioritize your time is to rule out things that absolutely won't work as quickly as as possible. If you ever hear, uh, if you ever talk about research in general terms with Barry Sharpless, one of the things that he'll emphasize to you is, you know, kill bad ideas as quickly as you can, and 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 that really res that it really is a direct reflection of this strong inference lo logic. Kill bad hypotheses with conclusive experiments as uh, as quickly as you can, and that will allow you to always work on the front foot. So let me just. Um, Kind of highlight how this strong inference workflow um, uh, works, and then and then you'll see this manifest in in several um, homework problems and exam problems and problems of the day throughout the class. So this is a form of uh, in, inductive logic or inductive inference. And it's, it's a little bit different than how we learn to do scientific research or how to think scientifically in elementary school or in middle school, where we learn to think one hypothesis at a time, design a hypothesis, design experiments to either uh, confirm or refute that hypothesis, and then, and then move on. But the, the strong inference model is to generate multiple hypotheses that essentially compete in a marketplace and, and only when all other reasonable hypotheses are excluded can you be confident that that you know at, at least this 
one hypothesis is, is still alive, or maybe it's two equal hypotheses that you can't distinguish between. Um, and so, um, as I said, it's a system of inductive inference, and, and uh, this was discussed extensively in the early 1900s by Francis Bacon and then, and then formalized in this um, Platt article. Um, so the, the workflow goes something like this. We, you, you go out into the world and you, you, you observe the natural world. You make an observation. This could be, for example, in the context of your research, um, you observe a new byproduct that you didn't expect from, from a reaction. You then um, list out all possible hypotheses. And I think why this step is important, and this is highlighted explicitly in the Platt article, is that there is a there is a fault of, of, of human psychology that is getting attached to a pet hypothesis. Um, if you, let's say you're working in organometallic chemistry and you observe a reaction and you say, this is my proposed mechanism for how it would take place, then throughout all of the rest of scientific history, that mechanistic model will always be associated with you. And so you, of course, have a natural uh, um, predisposition to hope that that hypothesis is right and then to run the wrong sorts of experiments, those that are confirmatory rather than those that can exclude that hypothesis. Whereas if you actually take the time to list out all possible explanations, then you're not necessarily psychologically wedded to any of them. So, so that's, I, th I think, really the power of this, of this approach. And then step three is to design critical experiments that um, have that that allow you to distinguish between these hypotheses. Uh, and, and the way I would think about this is each hypothesis, let's say it's a mechanistic hypothesis, each hypothesis makes a prediction about what would happen in scenario X. Um, let's say you know, in mechanism A, there's a, going to be a deuterium incorporated at position, at the beta position and, and uh, mechanism, uh, uh, the, the second mechanism, there, there won't be. And then you can run the experiment, get a clear outcome and see that there is no deuterium and that allows you to rule out the first, first possibility. And, and it turns out it's very hard to design experiments to rigorously rule out a, a hypothesis. Um, and I always like this, thinking this way because it really puts the onus on, on in you as a scientist to design really smart and clever um, experiments. And remember that those that are that have the power to exclude a mechanism have much more logical power in a strong inference workflow than those that are just consistent with the mechanism. And, and those I think are relatively easy to, to design. Um, So this is one of the things I like about notability. You can quickly adjust if you screw up your spacing. And this, I think, to me, it's it's always thrilling to do science this way because it, it makes you feel like you're you know you're Sherlock Holmes. Hence, hence the quote of the day from uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Um, you 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 feel like you're always doing hard work intellectually, um, and and then and then um, you know it keeps you always in, engaged with with what you're doing. So 
So after you design the experiment, of course, you have to execute it, and then you have to get a clean result. And I can tell you many times in our own group, we'll we'll design what we think is a clever experiment, and then you'll run the experiment, and for whatever reason, you won't be able to interpret it. Um, it's decomposition, or let's say you have you, you do get some product, but 80% of your material can't be accounted for and just makes you wary about, about what actually happened in the flask. Um, so this is a, certainly a non-trivial part of the, the workflow again, and then, and then to iterate. So, um, you know, it's, it's not uncommon that you could put forward what you think are all possible hypotheses in step two, and then you get to the end and you, you've ruled all of them out. And then it's back to the drawing board of trying to, to, to formulate more hypotheses. Um, and, and this process isn't you know, necessarily just something that you do in a week and then you're done with. It can, it can span multiple years or multiple decades as was in the case of when Einstein was formulating first special relativity and then general um, relativity where the actual experimental outcome um, uh, is, is something like that takes a decade in, 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 uh, in the making. Um, so I, 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 I like to take the time at the beginning of, of class to highlight this because um, as I said, when, 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 when we're thinking about observing some crazy looking organometallic reaction, um, it's important to take the time to bring that back to first principles. How, what are all the possible ways it could happen? And then what are the experiments that, uh, that hope, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll learn throughout the course that will allow us to distinguish between those, those possibilities. Uh, and, and I think if you, you know, if you, you, you'll, you'll, you'll recognize this strong inference workflow, even if it's not explicitly referred to that way, as you read through um, um, various papers, both from scripts and from, from, uh, from labs outside of script. Okay, so um, now let's transition into the, the main part of, of today's um, uh, talk, which, as I said, is um, is is going to be on uh, main group organometallic chemistry. First, just sort of a, a primer on organometallics and, and sort of how how to um, um, uh, what 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 the scope of this this course is and what the scope the scope of this this field is. Um, so I, I kind of think of organometallic chemistry as lying on this continuum between uh, hardcore inorganic or coordination chemistry and, and um, or organic chemistry. Um, and, and I think, you know, largely as these fields were developing, these were independent enterprises. And then I think in the, let's say 1950s or 1960s, there was a recognition that actually by using um, organometallic reagents or catalysts, you can enable unique modes of bond construction and, and synthesis. And, and now I think in some ways these, these fields are, are becoming indistinguishable because there are so many groups that do some, some catalysis or some, um, uh, or at least apply catalysis in the context of, of synthesis. Historically, these were, were different silos, but I think these are merging into, into one, um, uh, one, one silo. And I would, I would, if I had to situate, you know, the sum total of, of Scripps research um, uh, on, on this uh, spectrum, I, I would put it like here, um, which hopefully you can see this highlight. It's a, it's a little bit pale. Um, but this just goes to show that in your day-to-day, week-to-week um, um, exposure, you, 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 you won't get, um, you know, uh, necessarily you, you won't encounter people who are thinking deeply about group theory and, 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 uh, and, and spin orbit coupling and, and things like that. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't be interested in those topics. I think there's always opportunities to, to broaden your horizons by attending Gorn conferences or ACS meetings, et cetera. Um, and, and we've had many students from this department uh, graduate and, and go on to, to, to do postdocs and in, in more inorganic chemistry. And I think that in terms of like, um, Within, within this spectrum, I think there are different um, uh, scientific problems that, that, that are, are attractive to researchers in, in, this, uh, in, 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 in different parts of this continuum. Uh, and, and to some extent, this is reflected on what you know, national funding priorities are. But I think in organic chemists these days, they tend to focus on you know, fundamental studies of strong bond activation, of CO2 reduction, of transformations that are um, have to do with um, uh, energy conversion, like methane to methanol, and then for organic 
chemists or organic chemists who are, are, are you know, end users or developers of catalytic reactions. We tend to be focused on uh, transformations that can quickly generate molecular complexity, um, activate uh, positions that are hard to touch using conventional methods, um, form hindered bonds, for example. Um, and, and neither is right or wrong, but I'm, I just want to sort of situ situate that this is, this is a big field. Um, and, and in the class, I'll, I'll try to sample as much as I can from across the continuum, even though you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, what will be most relevant to you is probably on this right, right part of the, of the continuum. Um, in, in terms of just definitions in organometallic chemistry and, and what we sort of can, what we think of as being um, fair game in this course is, is any um, uh, a, 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 any molecule intermediate transition state that contains a uh, metal carbon bond or maybe even more generally a metal main group element bond. Um, And so, let me see. Okay, there we go. So what we'll talk about today is, is main group organometallic. This is the, the one topic in the class that's not really covered in the um, Hartwig uh, textbook. If you, if you uh, desire more reading material on this, I'm happy to, you can email me or the QAs. We're happy to uh, uh, happy to provide it, um, but we think this is important. I mean, uh, part of the the, in, in, in the the reason we added this is, is sort of by by the demand of, of of previous generations of students, and also just echoing back to this this survey that uh, the, the poll that we took at the beginning this is sort of the most common introduction people have to organometallic chemistry. It's the most commonly run organometallic reactions, and so it's important to uh, to uh, discuss them. And then I think one of the cool things you see is that. Um, a lot of the, actually the fundamental principles and reactivity that we'll learn in this context will also manifest later when we talk about organo transition metal um, chemistry. Um, so in, in 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 general, you know, throughout throughout the class, you'll you'll hear about um, um, you know reaction thermodynamics and reaction kinetics. Uh, you know, the former will use term will use language like more stable, less stable, unstable. Uh, driving forces, and then in the right in kinetics, we'll talk about you know something uh, being inert or 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 labile or fast or slow, um, and this is important to to to, um, to 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 take a step back and, and think about because um, you know for or for reaction um, you know re reactions have to have thermodynamic driving force, and and I think it's easy to like sit through a cross coupling lecture and and um, and, and, and seemingly know how to push arrows in a cross coupling reaction, but actually not have a concept of what the thermodynamic driving force for a cross coupling reaction is. Uh, and so hopefully through, through this course, you'll get an appreciation for, for both, both aspects. So to, to the extent possible, I, I like to try to bring things back to the basics. So I'll, I'll leave it uh, here in case people want to uh, uh, jot any of this down. Um, I'll, I'll try, I, I like to, you know, I, I, I sort of like to, to, to um, ground myself in fundamentals as much as possible. And so I think some of the fundamentals, if you're thinking about um, rationalizing reactivity across the periodic table, I think some of the fundamentals that are helpful to get back to are, are concepts that you learn in Gen Chem, like electronegativity. What is, you know, in a carbon metal bond, which of the two atoms is most electronegative? And that will tell you how ionic or covalent it is, for example. We'll, we'll, we'll go through some specific uh, specifics here. In it. Uh, thinking about uh, atomic uh, radius. Uh, so in the periodic table, the, the trends of atomic size are, are a little bit bizarre, but certainly in main group, you have a very clear sense from Gen Chem about, about the trends in atomic, atomic size. Um, uh, and, and then thinking about things like um, uh, oxidation potential, um, how, how reducing or oxidizing a given oxidation state of a, of a metal is, and that will tell you whether you know, chemistry is feasible or not. So I think to the extent possible, being able to bring things back to fundamentals that you, you, you already know is, is, is just a great, a great way to, to build this, uh, this, this framework that you're going to learn in this class um, out from, from things you're already familiar with. So, um, Oops. 
so I'd like to kick this off by just by just looking into the electronegativity data. Um, and, and, and this is surprisingly um, revealing. So here are our three main group elements that we're going to focus on in today's class, lithium, magnesium, and aluminum. Um, I'll put for comparison palladium. And this you can all you can find all this information on the periodic table. So let me move this down. I'll put this in a different color. So carbon here for comparison comes in at 2.55. Oops. And then just one more for benchmarking uh, chloride. So um, right, right off the bat, um, if, if you think about a lithium carbon bond, you can immediately appreciate that the carbon carbon is much more electronegative, much more electronegative than um, than, um, uh, than than lithium. And so you'll have strong delta minus character at carbon, strong delta plus character on lithium. And that is totally consistent with our intuitive sense of how, how an organolithium reagent reacts, which is that it will react immediately with a, a carbonyl compound, for example. And then if you if you contrast this to palladium, you see um, there's really not much electronegativity difference between palladium and, and carbon. I think this is one of the special uh, features that makes palladium um, as, a, as, a, as a metal catalyst. So, so, um, 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 uh, so, 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 so unique. Uh, the, the carbon palladium bond has strong covalent character. And so if you think about how it would react with um, highly polar functional groups like carbonyl compounds or nitriles, you would think, well, I wouldn't expect a CC bond to react with, uh, with, with, uh, with, with a carbonyl group. And, and, and perhaps then I shouldn't expect a carbon palladium bond to, to be strongly reactive with, uh, with a carbonyl group. And indeed, uh, carbon palladium bonds have, have more, uh, have, have, have stronger affinity for, for uh, CC pi bonds, for, 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 for instance. So I think this is, it's, this is really useful to, to get back to. And then if you're thinking about how, how like an organolithium compares to an organomagnesium to an organoaluminum, again, you can just get right back to electronegativity and that will give you a sense of, of, how, uh, of, of where the electrons in this, in this bond that we draw as, as, as covalent actually, actually lie. So one of the, um, I think, key principles in thinking about main group reactivity is that um, the metal carbon bonds, in terms of their homolytic bond strength, they, they are, are, are weak compared to the corresponding metal um, heteroatom bonds. And again, we know this intuitively. If you mix an organolithium with water, you're going to, you're, uh, you're, you're going to, um, um, the, the driving force for that reaction is going to be formation of the lithium alkoxide or lithium hydroxide. Um, um, but it's important again to think about these from 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 first principles. Um, and and again, this contrasts to some extent with with the, with the transition metal series, as we'll get to later. Um, so in terms of um, preparative methods for generating um, main group organometallics, we'll go through. Um, how many do we have here? Four, four different types. Some of these you will have run before yourself and some will be a little bit more exotic, but we'll try to cover them um, in a comprehensive manner. Um, so the first is um, oxidative addition. And, and this one, I, I think probably everybody in, on the call has done in, in, in making a, a Grignard reagent at some point in, in undergrad OCAM. Um, so you have an organohalide starting material in, in a, typically a, a metal in its in its fully reduced metallic form, um, not not always, but but most typically, uh, and then and then you're 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 formally adjusting the oxidation state from the metal from being uh, plus zero or, or zero to to typically plus uh, plus one or plus two, and then you're generating the um, corresponding metal. Um, uh, most typically halide, metal halide salt that's providing you the strong thermodynamic driving force for the reactions. So remember, the metal carbon bond you're forming is weak, so you need to have some driving force for the reaction to take place, and that's that's actually the other part of the equation that we don't normally draw. Uh, so here are some 
um, specific manifestations of this um, of this uh, principle. Again, chemistry I think that everyone will be familiar with: um, oxidation of metallic lithium to uh, a butyl uh, halide to make the corresponding and and Uli reagent and lithium uh, bromide in this case. Uh, formation of a phenyl Grignard through oxidation of bromobenzene to, to magnesium. Um, and then uh, here, here's an interesting one for, for generating um, organo uh, uh, mercury reagents, which have uh, super interesting reactivity. It's just a shame that mercury is so, so toxic, or I think there would be, um, a, you know, you'd see people using these types of reactions on a, on a daily basis. And indeed, they, they, you know, they very much did, chemi organic chemists very much did in, in the past. Um, so let me let me adjust this. Sorry, I'm going to adjust this one more time so I have enough writing room. So particularly in these two reactions, the high enthalpy um, of uh, the salt formation. Is what generally renders the reaction uh, exergonic. And then the, the situation is a little bit different in the case of um, mercury here. So for elements with high at at atomic number, And, and examples here include mercury, but not limited to mercury. So also thallium, lead, bismuth, mercury. The corresponding um, MC bond is, is weak. and not compensated for by the, this uh, enthalpy of salt formation. And so additional thermodynamic driving force is required Uh, hence the addition of um, sodium in this case, or, or um, often this is done in the form of a, a metal alloy. Okay, but I don't want to give you the impression um, that everything that there is to be known about elementary main group reactivity uh, is, is known. And so I, I'll highlight one recent example from the um, literature, and this will lead us to our uh, chemist of the day. And then we will also we, we will um, use this reactivity as a springboard for problem of the day to discuss problem of the day number one. So you can go ahead and um, um, uh, flip to your worksheet and, and take a look ahead of that if, if you want. So, so here's an example where low valent um, aluminum, it's not important here if you're um, not sure what the oxidation state of uh, aluminum is here, but if you take my word for it, this is aluminum one because this uh, diketamine ligand is, uh, is an anionic X1 ligand like ACAC. So the aluminum here is in its plus one oxidation state, um, but this special um, ligand uh, here prevents formation of any aggregates and also provides a lot of electron density to the metal. And so that allows it to react with what we typically view as inert bonds, namely in this case, an alkyl F or aryl F bond in this 
um, oxidative addition. The reference for this specific report is, is here. Um, maybe just because we'll see this again and again, does anybody want to uh, volunteer the structure, maybe in the chat window of this uh, aer special aryl group uh, dip? Is it diisopropyl phenylphosphine? It is. It, I th I think you got it. I didn't hear who that was, but thank you for volunteering. Um, it's it's just an aryl group, so there's no phosphine. Uh, but it's two six. Uh, Diisopropyl uh, and then link something I believe. Yep, two two six uh, diisopropyl phenyl, and and this you see again and again, especially in these kind of more modern main group research. Um, th this dip group, I think, is like a privileged substituent in, in ligand design and, and catalysis. Um, Barry Sharpless has postulated that like the isopropyl group has really special properties in in, in terms of of metal catalysis because it's. It is quite bulky, but it's not as in your face as a t-butyl group, um, so it can get out of the way when it needs to. So you'll see this again and again, um, including in Grubbs catalysts and palladium carbene catalysts, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Um, so let me see if I can flip over to the um, um, chemist of the day. So this uh, report of uh, CF oxidative addition comes from the lab of, of this fellow. If, if anyone can uh, take a stab at his name, either in the chat window or unmuting yourself. And if nobody knows, that's Is okay it mock well. framing? Indeed. Wow, very good. I didn't hear who that was. Uh, yeah, mock yeah. framing at Imperial College London, I believe. Oh, well, very good. Who, who are you? Maybe you can say your 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 name when you unmute yourself, so I can get to know everybody. Oh, it's Nguyen. Sorry, can you say it one more time? Uh, it's Nguyen. Nguyen. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Super. So this is uh, Mark Crimmen from um, Imperial, and. Um, he is um, in terms of his um, background, uh, he did his master's with Verinder Agarwal at Bristol in 2004. You don't have to, you don't have to write this down. You're not gonna be tested on it, but just so everyone knows. Uh, PhD at, at Imperial uh, 2008 with Mike Hill and Tony Barrett, postdoc with uh, Dean Tost and Bob Bergman at UC Berkeley. And then since 2011, he just barely fits in our first 10 year criteria, but he has returned to Imperial first as a, um, um, fellow, and then a lecturer, and senior lecturer, and now reader. And if you uh, don't know what those titles mean, even after spending two years working in the UK, I still don't know what those titles mean. But he's been doing very well. He's known for um, fundamental research and main group chemistry, bizarre coordination structures, and fundamental studies of geometry, as well as um, new approaches for strong bond activation. Okay, well, we're here now based on that very brief primer into low valent aluminum reactivity. Let's take a look at problem of the day um, number one. I think I already see there's a missing um, CC double bond there in the, this, this ligand is kind of like a quasi xanthos. It's like a xanthos designed for main group elements. Uh, and again, we see the dip. That's part of why I want to highlight it in the previous example. Um, so for this, um, this is, is challenging. I think there's some reactivity here that you probably won't have seen before. So what we're gonna do is take one minute to think about it on your own. And then we're gonna jump to breakout rooms with um, two or three people. And then we're gonna regroup here. Uh, this, we'll try to do this pretty quickly. Um, and if you're stuck, 
then don't feel bad. I think other people will be stuck, but try to at least, you know, reason through what, uh, what, what your intuition is telling you. Um, so take a minute to think about it now, and then we'll do a breakout room, maybe two minutes to discuss, and then we'll, we'll reconvene. Th three minutes to discuss, I guess. So yeah, take your time to think about it now. We'll prep the breakout rooms, and then we'll come back to discuss. Van, do you want to prep the breakout rooms? So in terms of when we reconvene to share your answer, you have a couple options. If you if you want and you're tech savvy and you have something written, you can you know screenshot it and share it. You can do it on ChemDraw, or you can just tell me what you mean. And that's probably the easiest. I'll just draw what you tell me to draw. And uh, and I will take this two minutes to pre-draw some of the structures so so to make things efficient. So okay, let's jump into the breakout rooms. And you do have to, I think, actively accept the invite to the breakout room. I think it assigned some, so you and Tanner are assigned also into some. Oh, room. that's fine. That's fine. Okay. Taiwei, Chinyu, are you there? Oh, so Chinyu, he had to go to orientation. So maybe I'll move Aaron to another room. Okay. Taiwei, are you there? So if he stepped away from his computer, just make sure that if he does join, that it would be to a room of three so there's someone's not stranded. Okay, I think everyone's in. Yeah, Trini's back and I put him in room one with two other people. Room six is back. They're back, okay.
Okay, do you want to recall everybody, Van? I don't know how long you gave them. I'm not sure either. Yeah, I think we can probably call everyone back. So there's like a countdown and it says that all the rooms will close in 40 seconds. Okay. Okay, are we all back? Not yet. There's still one. Not yet. Now. Okay. I don't want to spoil the suspense then. Okay, everyone should be back. Okay. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Let's go to the high tech random name generator. Okay, Nathan Dow, you prefer Nathan? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, what do you think, Nathan? Let okay, me so... share my, do you wanna instruct me on what to draw here? Yeah, so uh, I think that the first step the potassium is going to get uh, ripped off to generate okay. an aluminum one anion. Okay, let me catch up to you one minute. So minus potassium, and why does that get ripped off? Uh, because the two 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 crypt seems to okay. be. Yeah, coordinating yeah. to the potassium. You have a crown ether, and now this, as you said, was aluminum one. This is also aluminum one. And so, now you have an open open coordination site, which will denote throughout the class as just this this box. So uh, the benzene would now come in. Okay. And uh, coordinate to the aluminum one. Okay, how is it going to coordinate? Any thoughts? Uh, it can uh, either coordinate to one double bond or like two double bond or the whole benzene ring. Okay, so let me draw that out. So you said just draw into one of the double bonds like that through a pi interaction. So the pi orbital, filled pi orbital of the um, High bond orbital of the benzene are serving as a donor here so we can draw that like this and then what um and then it can possibly do an uh, oxidative addition into into uh the cc single bond okay that on the benzene certainly. ring a reasonable proposal. Okay, let me draw that. So what would the intermediate, uh, I guess, what is struck, what was you, were you thinking for the structure of B then? So it's going to be a uh, seven member ring with aluminum being, yeah, something like that. Now, the key is that the aluminum has an oxidation state change to aluminum three. Three, yeah. And then, okay. and then now we're almost there. Just do a double transmetallation into okay. the dimethyl tin chloride. Okay. Okay, good. Anybody get anything different?
Hear me. Are other... these or are these yeah, um are are these intermediates and ionic? Um, yeah, thanks for pointing that out, Omar. So you have a potassium plus here, so you have an outer sphere um, anion. Whoops. Um, not this one. So after you've removed potassium, then, then not. Is that, is that what you're asking about? Oh, I, I was thinking oh, that, sorry, that, that it's neutral in the beginning and then. It's neutral in the beginning. That's how it's drawn. Yeah, but you have, I, I think there's an outer sphere anion that's not drawn. So the overall thing is positive and we lose the positive charge and then it should be neutral from there on. Oh, okay. Hey, Kieran, Any other? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so what is what is the scope of this reaction? Like, is this special for benzene or is there a lot more insertions into other aromatic rings? I think it's somewhat special. Um, maybe that gets to one more question. Well, if anyone wants to propose, uh, can anyone think of another way that the CC bond could break other than direct CH oxidation? This is getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but Part of the goal here is just to illustrate some of the weird reactivity that main group elements can, can exhibit. Well, I mean, since you have the high system is coordinating to the aluminum, basically it can do the LMCT because it's aluminum one. So it breaks out the pi one to form a system that's similar to not caradine. And the not caradine system can undergo electrocyclization ring opening. Yeah, super brilliant, Wayne. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll just write down the reference so people can read this. Um, or I'll put post in the chat window, or, or maybe Tanner can post in the chat window uh, while I'm going ahead uh, in case people want to read more. But the basic idea is that you can form this high interaction that can actually formally undergo oxidative addition to make aluma, aluma cyclopropane. And then you have a metalla three pi, like a metallo Buchner rearrangement. Um, so that again is getting ahead of ourselves, but those are two plausible pathways. And we can, you know, you can think about how you would design an experiment to, to distinguish between, between them as, a, as homework and then, and then read the paper. Okay, super. So let's charge ahead just in the interest of time. I've got my eye on the clock and see that we still have a fair amount of material to uh, cover here. So I want to be mindful of that and be mindful of your time. Um, so back to uh, different ways to uh, synthesize um, uh, organometallics. So um, uh, one category was oxidative addition that we covered before. Another is um, exchange, uh, which is sort of a broad term for just encompassing anything where you're getting a new organometallic and you're going in with a pre-existing um, organometallic. Um, and so that includes um, two flavors of these could both really be thought of as, as like transmetallation, but one here we call transmetallation and the other is just called metal exchange. That's really two flavors of transmetallation. One where you have a uh, metal that is typically in its metallic form uh, in plus zero oxidation state, and then your preformed organometallic, you mix them together, you form a new organometallic from the metal that was previously in the metallic form, and then you form that uh, other metal is, is lost as the reduced metal. And so the key consideration here, whether this can or cannot happen is totally determined by the delta delta G, the um, enthalpy of, um, or uh, the Gibbs free energy of, of formation uh, and, and the relative um, stabilities of the starting materials and, and, and the, the products. Um, another scenario which will look familiar, for example, in the context of, of 
of like Suzuki coupling, but which is also true as main group, is this organometallic to organometallic exchange where you have Rm exchanging with R prime, M prime. Um, and again, the key, you know, these processes are really, you can draw them, I have them drawn as forward arrow, but it could be drawn as equilibrium arrow, reversible arrow. And the question of whether they take place or not is, is, is purely um, th thermodynamic in, in, in nature. And then you have um, another uh, flavor, which I th think some of you will have um, also run before, uh, which we, we refer to here using the nomenclature metathesis. It's an organometallic plus a metal halide. And um, we exchange the um, halide substituent for the metal. And here the consideration is that the, the M should be more electropositive. Again, getting back to first principles. And then I guess what could be viewed really as sort of a subset of, of what I just described, but um, reactions where, um, oh, sorry, so, so the uh, C is the um, organometallic plus metal halide, and then uh, 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 D is organometallic plus organo halide. And the one that we um, are probably most familiar with in the context of synthetic work is um, lithium halogen exchange. And again, so. So again, uh, central to this, the success of this approach is, is the thermodynamics. And here the, the important factor in thinking about the thermal chemistry is which of the two R groups is better st it's stabilizing negative charge. So this works well for aryl substituents because as we know, aryl uh, groups are better at stabilizing organum um, uh, negative charge than, than uh, our alkyl substituents. This only practically works for um, organo um, iodides or aryl iodides, bromides, rarely chlorides, and essentially never fluorides. Does anyone, uh, and this is typically fast when, when it works, does anyone want to hazard a guess on why aryl fluorides typically can't participate in um, SNAR? We just open this up to anybody who wants to take a stab. No takers. So what could possibly go wrong? If I added fluorobenzene plus N butyl lithium, what would happen? Maybe they will form benzene. Brilliant. Thank you, Fung. So um, compared to 
chloride, bromide, or iodide, fluoride has a stronger effect in terms of acidifying the CH bond adjacent. So these types of organometallic plus fluoroarenes typically don't result in lithium, uh, lithium halogen exchange because the benzene formation is, is rapid. So that's just an important tip that might you might encounter in your work, future work as a medicinal chemist, for example. Okay, that brings us to problem of the day number two. So let's flip to that. So this one, uh, I'll just read it aloud. The activity of n-butyl lithium decreases in a few hours after it is dissolved in THF. So this one, I'll just ask you to think for a minute on your own, and then I will call on a volunteer. Um, and if you don't know, that's okay, but at least just try to think about initially what would happen THF plus n-butyl lithium. And then if you, that will be a good starting point. So it'll take 15 seconds, 30 seconds to think about that, maybe draw out what you'd expect to form initially, and then that will be a starting point for thinking about what irreversible process might happen. The ominous shake of the of the names. I will get ready by drawing out THF. Noor, what do you think might be the problem here? Um, so I would imagine that initially when you dissolve butyl lithium and THF, it will coordinate. Um, but I also would think uh, it could deprotonate the alpha position. So that would destroy your reagent. Okay, so let's, let's explore that. So you're totally right, as we'll get to um, very shortly. Uh, organolithiums are typically aggregates and can be broken up by THF. Um, so you mentioned that first, and then that ultimately it would form this deprotonated um, THF with loss of um, and butane. And then um, could you think of anything that might happen further from this intermediate? So I know that can further fragment into multiple products. Um, I think ethylene would be one of them, if I'm not mistaken. Beautiful. Okay. So ethylene, of course, the gas. And then I think the other, if you just balance atoms, the other thing is the lithium enolate form of acetaldehyde. And if you want, you could push arrows, um, I think, like. Um, Carrie, are you trying to draw something? Thank you, Van. Sorry. I was doing so well, but I knew it was only a matter of time before I started drawing with the wrong screen shared. So this is what uh, Neuer proposed. So deprotonation at the alpha position and then multiple things can and indeed do form, but the pr prominent byproducts are um, ethylene and lith uh, lithium enolate form of acetaldehyde, um, and you can think about how to push arrows to to um, to get that. I think it's easy if you if you draw it like like this. That might that might help. So you can think about how to how to push arrows there. Okay, very good. Any questions? Anyone get anything different? Okay, let's talk about another class of, um, of reactions, some of which I think will be familiar to you. These are insertions. We'll go through these um, somewhat quickly. Um, I think this should be 
probably familiar looking chemistry. So you can add a metal hydride, for example, to a CC pi bond. And then this is probably familiar to you from especially hydroboration, hydrosilation, et cetera, and hydrozirconation. Zirconium is, has some special properties, but same, same idea. You can also add an organometallic across a CC pi bond. This is probably most common, um, common with um, aluminum, carboalumination reactions. Typically reagents that contain both uh, a metal hydride and a metal carbon bond will preferentially insert the hydride as opposed to the um, uh, the, the carbogenic group. That's a fairly general. And then another um, that can either take place photochemically, thermochemically, or thermally, or even in the presence of a metal are uh, carbene insertion reactions. It's driven by formation loss of um, N2. Hey, Carrie, sorry to interrupt you, but I think yep. a lot of people are having internet problems at Scripps and a bunch of people emailed me and some people got kicked out as well. Okay. So for example, that dye ball would be one reagent where you see this trend. So this just for anybody who's having connectivity problems, I'll, I'll just kind of try to keep pressing forward. Um, sorry if it's a little bit clunky here, but um, as long as there's a decent recording of this, then I just encourage you to tune back in for anything that you miss, or if you want a copy of these, these notes, then, then um, and, and I'm happy to provide them. Oh, I realized that I, I, there's just two more bullet points I wanted to add up here. Sorry to jump around. I always hated it when people when people did this, but that's what I'm going to do just so that we have a comprehensive collection of notes. So this um, example that Noor helped us with was supposed to be illustrative of, which is why it was placed where it was. Um, Of, um, of these uh, just deprotonative pathways to form organometallics um, metallation. Here, the important thing is to have alkali M and kinetic uh, or. Uh, kinetic CH uh, acidity, and then with mercury, specifically, there's a pathway that's sort of like a, almost like a um, CH activation process. And this can happen um, twice. Di organomercuries seem to be the most most stable. Okay.
And so the last type um, of reaction we'll talk about are um, eliminations. The classic one is uh, decarboxylation um, in the presence of mercury. Kind of a precursor to modern decarboxylative coupling reactions or um, at least one can think of it that way. So upon thermolysis, one gets um, loss of CO2. So loss of CO2 is the driving force here. 